Good afternoon. At this time, please welcome NASIO President Dennis Goulet. Welcome everyone to the third and final day of the NASIO Mid-Year Conference. I've really enjoyed the discussion so far and getting to visit with colleagues virtually. I know we all hope to reconnect in person very soon. Uh, the annual conference is scheduled to be held in Seattle this October. The NASIO team and executive committee are watching the guidelines nationwide and those specific to the state of Washington. We see very positive trends and are planning for an in-person event. At this point, it's not known if there will be any limitations in our gathering, but as details are known and decisions are made, we'll be sure to pass those along. I have a poll question for you related to the conference. Please navigate to the hub to answer. Do you plan to be at an in-person NASIO annual conference October 10 through 13? Yes, I'm raring to go. No, undecided, I'm waiting and seeing. Okay, so very positive trends here. No, I don't see any no's. So we have some folks on the fence still, um, but I think uh, overwhelmingly, um, we're ready to be back together again. And that's really encouraging to me. Um, thank you so much for your feedback. That's really helpful. It's consistent with what we've seen and other polling that we've done. And uh, we'll keep you posted over the summer. We'll, again, we'll be watching this very carefully. If you've missed any of the great session, don't worry. All sessions are recorded and will be available on demand to all registered attendees through July 6th. You can access the videos via the conference hub starting next week. There is also still time to participate in feats of strength to win great prizes. All details are in the conference hub. Also in the hub are the community notes. It's been great to see all those notes. I know I have lots of takeaways. Donations are still being collected for the Girls in Technology, our give back partner for mid-year. If you missed the opening session and their video, make sure to check out the details in the hub. Today's theme is Inspire. We'll be talking about what's on the horizon and how technology can be leveraged to capitalize on opportunities and help mitigate challenges. Thank you to the Inspire Daily Content sponsors, Accenture, IBM, and Microsoft. Also, a big thank you to the mid-year platinum sponsors, Deloitte, Fortinet, Fortinet, and Genesis. To introduce the first session, David York Sr., the Senior Vice President for the U.S. Public Sector at Genesis, will provide some brief remarks. Welcome, David, and thank you, Genesis, for your support of the event. Good afternoon. I'm Dave York, Senior Vice President, U.S. Public Sector at Genesis. We are proud to be a platinum sponsor of the Mid-Year Conference and show our support of NASIO and the broader state IT community. Today's conference theme is around inspiration, exploring how government can harness technology to propel opportunities forward and help mitigate challenges. Genesis believes that empathy is the key ingredient that allows us to leverage technology to its fullest potential. Leading with empathy and decision-making and design improves the citizen experience and maximizes the impact of agency employees supporting citizen needs. Ultimately, empathetic service improves the communities in which we all live and work. We're currently seeing the intersection of empathy and technology in the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. States are using data to better understand how to improve vaccine distribution, communications, and access. Empathy and technology intersect in the more routine as well. For example, a website or app that allows us to renew a license easily in the midst of a busy day shows consideration for our busy schedules. Now each year, NASIO conducts a survey of the state CIOs to understand their areas of focus for the coming year. It's no surprise that digital services ranks number two on this year's NASIO survey of top 10 priorities for state CIOs. Since the pandemic clearly accelerated the demand for online services and put renewed focus on the digital citizen experience. Through the power of cloud and AI, Genesis helps state agencies deliver on the promise of digital government. 
We provide a suite of capabilities to increase citizen self-service, offer personalized interactions and leverage data-driven insights, all with empathy and the citizens end goal in mind. It's exciting to think of how we'll continue to partner with states in the near future as needs and technologies continue to change and shift. And that's what today's opening session will dis explore. While disruption and change are a constant, the past year and a half brought both of these in abundance to pretty much every person and every industry. How will this shape how we live and work in the coming years? What do the societal changes mean for state government? What role does IT play? And how can states prepare now to anticipate future needs? I'm pleased to introduce the panel discussion that will help us project to life in 2025. Amanda Crawford, Executive Director of the Texas Department of Information Resources, will serve as the moderator. Our panelists are Dr. Steve Nichols, Chief Technology for the State of Georgia, Lee Rainey, Director of Internet and Technology Research at the Pew Research Center, and Bill Eggers, Executive Director of the Center for Government Insights at Deloitte. Thank you and enjoy your day. Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today at this panel. I'm very excited uh, to join, uh, to have joining with me here today, uh, Lee, Steve and Bill, as we talk about uh, this particular topic. Um, when we're, You know, if the last 14 months have taught us anything, um, I think it's been for all of us here is how to pivot. You know, we as technology leaders, I think are uniquely positioned to be able to pivot quickly since our discipline really evolves around change. Our technology world is constantly evolving and we evolve with it. Um, we're always looking forward and imagining what that future will look like. Here in Texas, my agency's vision is to transform how Texas government serves Texans. So this topic of looking forwards towards transformational change in the future is one that's close to my heart. And I'm sure many of you have similar visions and goals as well. So now, as we thankfully see an end to this pandemic, what does our next normal look like? To kick off today's discussion, we have a couple of poll questions for you. So first let's look at how you feel about remote work. And I believe you're gonna to need to go to the hub to answer this question. So how difficult have you and your colleagues found it to transition this past year to remote work? Do you find it very easy, somewhat easy, somewhat hard, very hard, or was this your own version of Dante's seventh circle of hell? Um, it's awesome I'm seeing a lot around the easy, very easy, excellent. Somewhat easy, somewhat hard. Nobody's in the seventh circle of hell. That's outstanding. <laughs> always, always, always a plus. Great. All right. Well, next, we'd like to hear about what you think your biggest challenges will be as we head towards 2025. What does that future look like for you? So what's the, the biggest challenge? Is it gonna be your remote or hybrid workforce? I think we're seeing a lot of the workforce themes come up in a lot of the articles around this. Security threats, delivering essential services in this new technology environment. Misinformation, trust of government. All right, obviously lots, Lots of input, security top of mind for most of us. How do we keep up with that skilled workforce? All right. Excellent. Well, I appreciate your y'all's feedback on those on those questions, and I think what you'll see is uh, we're going to be able to cover a lot of those topics here today. So um, let's kick it off and let's talk first about one of the things that were really top of mind for you all as shown by those poll questions is look at the hybrid workforce. Um, among the many challenges that we face during the pandemic is exactly how do we manage that remote workforce? Um, many states now are transitioning to what looks to like a hybrid remote and in-office uh, team. 
And you know, what does that look like for the future of our government IT workforce? I'll open it up to the panel and, and see who maybe wants to jump in and, and tackle this question first. How about you, Steve? <laughs> okay, as we're all as we're all waiting to see who's gonna who's gonna <laughs> pick up the mic. Um, you know, so Georgia has been um, has been remote for, I guess, uh, 15 months now, at least in the metro Atlanta area where all the headquarters agencies are. Uh, agencies are kind of at the moment, they're on their own to decide, you know, when they're going to start bringing people um, back in the office. Uh, I think that um, one thing we're all kind of dreading is uh, some kind of a hybrid scenario where half the people are in the office and half aren't. But uh, being in a, in a place where uh, traffic is sort of uh, just very, very bad all the time, this has been a, a, you know, kind of a pretty nice um, year for most people. And I think uh, they're looking for a lot more remote, remote work uh, going forward. Oh, absolutely agree. I, one thing around this, the, the dreaded hybrid workforce, which I agree. I mean, that, I think that's one of my concerns. Um, I'm curious, and for the others, you know, on the panel, the input and, and maybe what some of the research is showing. For me, my perspective, I'm not really concerned from a technology perspective, but kind of from the logistical perspective and the management perspective of how we're able to keep uh, cohesive teams um, and, and, and what that looks like and in building out, particularly for government, where that kind of hybrid environment has not been something that we've typically done. And certainly our constituents' expectations are a little bit different for government than the, maybe they are for the private sector. Um, Bill or Lee, do y'all have any insights into that? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, from the research that we've done and, and meeting with little hundreds of both federal, state, and local clients around this topic, um, we see really three majors, three main models, approaches to the hybrid workforce. One is what you call back to the office plus where teams work mostly on site with some telework flexibility. And that's Department of Veteran Affairs is doing that, Social Security Administration, Microsoft, a number of other sort of companies. So that's, that's one model. Second model is virtual, but with guardrails where teams are provided latitude with constraints. So the Department of Defense has recognized the benefits of telework. They're literally expanded their remote work capabilities to almost 1 million personnel. Um, and so we're seeing that in a number of defense agencies and others with these sort of guardrails. And then we're seeing virtual first, um, where teams are empowered to choose the best location that makes the most sense for them. Uh, Deloitte, that's, that's what we're moving towards. Uh, Salesforce is doing that. Um, and, and I will say, you know, when we look at states, we see a number of states, you know, headed in this, in these different directions. In Tennessee, um, Tennessee Medicaid has made the decision to have over 70% of their workforce move to a full telework posture, and they've been able to completely eliminate one of their office buildings by, by doing that. Uh, Massachusetts is another example where they're moving toward what they call a virtual first um, kind of post-COVID scenario. I would love to add to that those really smart points by saying that we've been through a gigantic social experiment in the past 15 months, and we're heading into an even bigger one in relation to telework and hybrid workplaces. Um, norms have to be reconfigured. Um, the new studies have to be done about which form of work yields the most, the most and best results. There are clearly some things that in-person uh, interactions are supreme for, and there are clearly some things that can be done remotely that um, lose no uh, material, uh, you know, uh, sense of, of people um, doing the work that needs to be done. Um, it also sort of surfaces new kinds of, of fissures in your workforce. There are generational fissures. Younger uh, workers have very different expectations from older workers. Extroverts and introverts have very different experiences. And this whole um, the ballet that's gonna have to be done in offices about how do you treat in-person workers and remote workers the same way so that unfairnesses don't creep into that sort of standard supervisor employee relationships that everybody worries about. Absolutely. I mean, there's just so many things I think for us to consider. And I also think, you know, again, we get back to constituent expectations um, and, and that trust in government. And so I'm wondering what, what, what that looks like um, as well. I think that 
you know, one of the things we look at with our workforce and, and certainly in what we do is being able to deliver. I mean, if you think about it, you know, government at, as, as, at its essence, the, the true product that we deliver is customer service. And we have to be able to do that. That's what consistently across the board we do. And, and, and that is what, you know, the people we serve expect of us. And, and we can, um, we have autom- we can automate things and we can provide digital delivery, delivery, but there is a human element to all of that, particularly in so many of the services that government provides, um, you know, when, when dealing with some of the things that are truly some of the most intimate aspects of people's lives. And so I think that that is something as we're looking forward is how do we keep that human element of service um, when we are continuing to to automate, and I know we'll talk a little bit about our, our delivery, and maybe that's a good segue to go in to talking about um, the new digital delivery of services. But I, before we leave this topic, would just like to see what what thoughts y'all might have about that trust in government and and what what the public thinks about us doing things more remotely. I think Bill has some fresh things to share. At Pew, we we know that trust in government is is quite low. The other um, variable that's very much in play now and top of mind is people's information ecosystems. You know, wh- where they get information from and how they receive it and how they work it out with their community is now an incredibly important variable for how they feel about what government's doing, regardless of whether services are being well delivered to them or not. Yeah, I can actually present some uh, data. So we've been going out into the field and surveying 4,000 Americans looking at trust in government at the federal, state, and local level, and not just government as a whole, but actually individual government agencies, uh, because we think that's much more actionable. So the first thing to understand is that really there's four sort of trust signals that make a big difference in terms of how people think about trust in the institution. They're humanity, transparency, reliability, and capability. And you need to be working on all that. So if you're a law enforcement agency, you could be very, very capable and reliable. But if you don't have the humanity, your trust numbers are going to go down. So we've seen very, very low trust numbers right now with law enforcement agencies. So the the good news, um, and this is some fresh data that we haven't even published yet, but um, uh, state government is much more trusted right now than um, the federal government. Um, Local governments are the most trusted institutions right now. But what we also found was that the aggregate of state agencies are much more trusted than when you ask about state government as a whole, similar to when you ask about your member of Congress versus um, Congress members. Um, And so that's actually good news. And what I can say is that there are some some of the agencies are, are very trusted child care agencies, actually the most trusted in state government. Uh, some of the, the least trusted right now are unemployment insurance because of a lot of the, the, the issues along those lines. And there's also some problem, you know, DMV and other agencies also are low trust numbers right now. Um, and we did find that there are two key influencers about trust in state government right now amongst the citizens we surveyed. And that first one is satisfaction with government's handling of COVID-19. And we, we also see that globally. So if you look globally in many countries that handled it well, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, South Korea, they have higher trust numbers in government now than they've had in decades, essentially because of that. Not so, not so much in the US. Um, the second one that we found was, and that's really important is their approval of data privacy and digital service standards offered by state government, which was kind of surprising that that rose that much and it shows how important those sort of areas are, especially with all the digital service delivery. That's fascinating. So we see that um, certainly, you know, the, the the pandemic has has done so much to to change many things in our world, and obviously it's, it's changing trust in government for the better in certain areas, um, as Bill pointed out. So let's talk about how um, how the pandemic drove adoption or acceleration of of some of the new technologies, as well as the constituent expectations for that increased digital delivery. So I'd like to hear maybe from Steve, if your priorities um, shifted during the pandemic and if so, how, and then looking forward to the future, you know, what's, what's here to stay? What do we need to tweak a little? What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I, I think if I was gonna sort of distill what we, what we learned here in Georgia, really the three things um, or the three categories of technology that really, really happened for us were, uh, first of all, chatbots. This was a story for, I think most of the states, like 38 of the states where we went from you know, zero, having really just a, a few agents, small agency level 
uh, implementations to having answered, you know, by the end of 2020, maybe um, two and a half million questions from citizens um, and had, had implemented for like four agencies. Um, I think the second was low code, no code solutions. So uh, mm -hmm. vendors, um, vendor partners kind of brought some low code, no code solutions for things like um, COVID test scheduling or vaccine scheduling as we went along. And while we had some uh, low code solutions already implemented, like they were all at the departmental level, we'd never done it at scale. So seeing that done, you know, where you're talking about, um, you know, numbers in the millions, uh, you know, that gave us a lot of, a lot of confidence. And then probably the third thing was just the scalability of cloud solutions. So we had a mix of things in the uh, on-prem data center and in the cloud and being able to like, for example, scale up our, our public health uh, website, which was hosted in the, uh, in the Amazon cloud uh, to deal with what was like a 15,000, 15,000% increase in traffic uh, in March of 2020, um, that was just a game changer for us. So those were probably the three big takeaways for Georgia. I think we had a similar thing um, here in Texas, so I could probably echo that. And, you know, shifting priorities, and I imagine maybe for y'all and, and for other states as well, is that I wouldn't say that for our agency, certainly our priorities shifted that much because we've always been advocating <laughs> and pushing for these sorts of solutions and to be forward thinking and the, have this, the scalable uh, modern solutions that, that can provide this transformational um, uh, government idea. But I, what shifted, I think, is the adoption and the acceptance now of our customer agencies who, who truly were able to, to see that need. And I think we're seeing that trend continue here in Texas, and we'll continue to see more of that um, evolution. But it also came um, with you know, challenges, uh, certainly, moving, moving forward as we're moving so rapidly. So you know, things like maybe um, accessibility, um, uh, was something and whether or not, I think a true, something to look at is did what we provide, was it just online access to existing government processes or was it really a true digital transformation? So, um, curious if Steve or the others also have sort of thoughts on that, on how to face the, some of those challenges, um, and, and what we can do to keep that momentum going forward um, with some of the progress we've made in, in digital delivery of government services. Well, uh, I, I guess uh, you make a, a good point about adoption, Amanda, and whether it's a true digital transformation. I think uh, you, you mentioned accessibility. I would also throw uh, mobile, uh, mobile devices into the mix where, you know, when you increase the, the number of citizens that are coming, you're increasing the, your exposure to problems with uh, accessibility and mobile devices. I, I think for uh, Georgia.gov in the last 12 months, it ended up being 65% of all of our traffic was, was mobile. So the applications we had that were not really mobile ready or not mobile friendly, that really showed out. And then likewise with accessibility, uh, you know, dealing with some of the ADA complaints that we got uh, because of applications that just, just couldn't handle it. When you, so point being, when you force all your constituents onto the, uh, you know, kind of into a digital channel, you better be ready for that. And I'll, I'll just jump in there uh, quickly. So we, we actually surveyed 800 government officials on COVID-19 uh, and its impact on digital transformation. And, um, you know, a lot of, we also did the private sector and a lot of, I think, really interesting results. One is that overwhelmingly, they said that digital helped cope with COVID-19. They're seeing positive impact. 80% said they're seeing positive impact from it. Um, and in terms of actually, like what their priorities were, one of the interesting things is that so the top priorities were things such as um, enhancing citizen customer experience, innovating faster, modernizing legacy systems. Uh, the lowest priorities were actually things like cost reduction and increase in revenues from digital. So that's not top of mind right now from various officials. But I think what we, what we saw with COVID-19 is kind of the third stage of digital transformation. The first stage was a dot-com era, um, e-gov and everything. And, and Mandy, I actually, I was executive director of the e-Texas commission way back then. <laughs> so that was years <laughs> ago when I lived in Austin. 
And, and then we moved into more doing digital, a lot of digital things going on and a lot of stuff. And that's kind of USDS and 18F and a lot of those sort of things. And I think we're, we really moved into really becoming a digital organizations and digital first in government. But the final stage is really about being digital. And that requires sort of different things. So personalization, frictionless experience, proactive service delivery based on life events, universal digital identity, anticipatory government, omnichannel strategies. Very few governments I think are there right now. Estonia is there, Singapore and a few other governments, but I think that's the kind of the next stage and taking all the momentum we've seen from the last year and a half and really continuing to accelerate that. And what we also found 66% said that they're going to be increasing financial commitments uh, to digital over the next few years. And a key to that though, uh, which are all fantastic um, ideas and, and certainly very aspirational to get there, but that's goes back to that trust in government piece, doesn't it? Is that in order to be able to provide that, we need to make sure that, that the folks who are serving um, trust those uh, services and that they're secure. And, um, and, and, and again, going back to, I think what Lee said as well, about where, where the, the data is stored, what we're controlling, all of that, that matters very much to our constituency. The big case study that we saw that, that raised all kinds of warning flags in this area, even as people were deeply appreciating all the innovation that was going on through the contact tracing process, where um, there were so many people who were so wary, just in the context that Bill is talking about, what was going to happen to their data, who was going to be the custodian of, of it, with whom was it going to be shared, um, how trustworthy were the people literally I was talking to on the telephone or at my front door. And so there are the there are all sorts of ways in which people appreciate the convenience, um, the, the, the seamlessness of lots of interactions they're having with government. But it, when, when it comes to the big stuff, particularly related to health and sometimes related to school as well, they, these are just elevated levels of sensitivity and concern that are, are top of mind for lots of Absolutely. citizens. Uh, any thoughts on how we as, as government um, can, can get around that? I mean, what are the things that, that we can do to help increase that trust? I don't want to step on anybody's toes, but it, 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 it's, yeah, blocking and tackling. Uh, and, and getting the sort of base. Certainly a public health worker that is called calling on the phone or knocking on you, a trust. The, the, there's a premium on a sort of social innovation as well as technological innovation at the government level and thinking about um, pathways into people's uh, trusting hearts. And, and you know, uh, Mandy, I mean, we, the, so the, for the IT functions, right, the state IT function, we all had a lot of competition uh, from citizen coders during the, um, you know, during the pandemic. I mean, this is something we've talked about in the past and crowdsourcing and the problem was always how do you get it started I think with things like all the DIY um, you know sort of COVID epidemiology sites that popped up um, you know uh, sites to help you or apps to help you find COVID tests then when the vaccines came vaccine schedulers uh, there was a lot of citizen coding going on um, you know in some cases doing a better job than the government functions could do which which I think just makes it that much more um, you know, difficult to find trust if someone is really thinking about like they're going to get their information from uh, a crowdsourced website. Yeah, absolutely. And why we need to be forward thinking. I love the ideas around building um, not just that technology trust, but the uh, social trust. But of course, it gets back to, like you said, Lee, very appropriately blocking and tackling. And as I say, you know, no forced errors, no, no friendly fire on our part. We've got to make sure that, that we're really delivering it. Um, properly and that we have a clear vision for what we're doing. Um, it's great. Um, lots of good discussion here. So what, what else, anything else that anyone wants to talk about on this topic of the, of the, you know, the, the new technologies before we, we move on to 
to our next topic. Anything else? Well, just on the trust and privacy part, um, it, it is in some of the, the survey data that we've have is still you've, you still have a large percentage of citizens, more so here than we see in Europe, who are um, have very very big sort of big brother concerns about data sharing and privacy and so on. Um, you know, I, I think an interesting country to look at is Estonia, which was kind of the first one to really get 100% digital, and um, they are the most digital government in the world, and they also have something called once only there, and 17 other countries in Europe are moving this direction, whereas you give your information to government only once, and you never have to give it again, depending on what level of government, because of the information sharing. Now that seems pretty pretty wild here, but one of the ways that they've dealt with that is that you as a citizen actually get to, you. there's transparency into which agencies have actually looked at your data and why. So you, you're able to actually see that. And you're also able to give different levels of permission, depending on how much personalization you want and everything in, ter in terms of how much, um, what government can actually look at there. And if it's found that someone has accessed your data in a way where they're not actually allowed to, they didn't need to, they could actually be prosecuted for it. And they spend a lot of time talking to the citizens about that and really informing them of it, which, which I think has helped a lot in terms of gaining that trust. And a lot of the European countries now, as they watch that and they're trying to move towards once only and digital ID are learning a lot of lessons, I think, from that example. That's an excellent point. Giving um, giving our constituents control over the data that government's collecting and, and having them have that transparency into that process, I think would go a huge way towards, towards building back that trust. So, all right. So next topic, as we look to 2025 is do, you know, we, we, we have an eye towards the technology and, and, and an eye towards maybe where we want to go based, based on what the, the, our constituents are asking for, but do we have the, um, the contracting vehicles to get there? Do, what do our you know, state procurement and contracting laws look like? Are, have they evolved to the point where they allow us to be agile, to move quickly? We know lots of folks move quickly because they were maybe operating under emergency orders um, and executive orders from, from their state leadership that allowed them to um, move quickly or faster through procurements than they normally would be. Um, is that something that should stick around? Um, are there lessons learned from that? And, you know, looking again, as, as that, you know, as, as Doug and, and Nasio frequently talk about the CIO as a broker model and looking at these outsourced solutions, what does the future in 2025 uh, look like for us as we're procuring these technologies uh, to implement? Steve, any thoughts around that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. So um, I think what, what we, so we learned sort of two uh, conflicting things, I think, during the pandemic. So one is um, having pre-existing relationships was was pretty important. We ended up working more with um, with the suppliers who are already uh, under contract, as opposed to just going out and standing up something brand new. But by the same token, we did a lot of amendments for things that we'd never um, contemplated in the original. Uh, contract. And I think that was where the procurement people, you know, get a little uncomfortable is like, okay, this, this was nowhere in the original procurement, what we're about to do. And like, yes, I know, but pandemic, we got to do it. So uh, probably getting more flexible about how to evolve contracts is going to be the um, kind of the, the challenge we need to lean, lean into here. Absolutely. I, I will um, uh, second that, that the you know, this is really a time where I, I saw truly that whole community, um, the whole industry come together to want to be able to help and to want to be able to assist and, and, and really relying on those partnerships that we have um, with, with our vendor community was essential to being able to respond um, quickly and effectively here. And, and we've seen that also in other events. When we had a big ransom, statewide ransomware event um, a couple of years ago, that was something else where we just saw this overwhelming response. So one thing I for us in Texas is, you know, we have a big managed services program and we have our cooperative contracts too, um, the program that we have here. Um, so we, we have avenues for that technology on retainer that allows us to move quickly and to, and to be agile, but, the, but there still is, um, it's a balancing act. We want to be quick and we want to be able to do this, but we also have to be mindful of competitive procurements. Um, I, Bill, do you have, have y'all looked at anything and, and have any insights around that, um, the, the contracting or the outsourcing world? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I wanted to start off by saying that when we talk about, you know, agile at scale in a way, just in terms of from a development standpoint, you know, Texas Health and Human Services is probably one of the best examples in the country, I think, at the state level of doing that from a tiers perspective. And so it's maybe something you can jump in and talk about. But I think there's a a number of trends that we see kind of going forward. One is, of course, uh, agile, a much more a, mod, a more modular, more flexible approach to procurement, a points-based, using points-based um, to actually do that outcome-based procurement where you're seeking innovation from vendors by you're defining the outcome required rather than defining how the outcome needs to be achieved. Um, the IRS is doing that focused on outcomes that allows them to test new technologies on faster timelines. Uh, we're starting to see dynamic contracting where you have new suppliers who are coming on board throughout the contract period rather than restricting access to a single vendor. And, uh, you know, the state of California and a few other states have actually been looking at the U.S. The Department of Defense and looking at they're doing, what they're doing with OTAs or other transaction authority agreements under which innovations in certain categories that are valued below an X amount of money are exempt from many of the federal acquisition rules and seeing can they do something like that, put those things in place at the state level. Interesting. Hugh doesn't have lines of sight into procurement things, but on the citizen side there, are, I love Steve's notion that, that there are conflicting cross pressured things that are happening. So at the one level, you have quite engaged, civically minded citizens who would love to help. And, and, and the hackathon example and, and the sort of uh, do-it-yourself sort of ways in which data were gathered and, and disseminated outside the context of, of civil servants and things was one dimension of that. And, and it, it sort of raises interesting possibilities for what used to be called public-private partnerships just to sort of potentially tap into that enthusiasm. And the exact opposite uh, trend is that um, there are lots of vigilant citizens who think that um, you couldn't, you should be more scrutinized even more than you currently are, you should be able to account even more than you are, and that um, that something funny is always going on, and that procurement processes ought to be um, sort of ripe uh, areas for exploration um, and uh, and you know um, enthusiasm. So it's. Um, the citizens are playing an interesting sort of surrounding role to the kinds of conversations that it sounds like are going on in your offices. Absolutely, and 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 I think that you know uh, certainly where we're sitting here is uh, we get the sense and and um, that our constituents don't really care necessarily if it's outsourced. Um, they want to make sure that they're getting the services they need, right? And and at a good value, um, um, I think as well long term. So that's. Um, it's certainly something positive as we face going back to the workforce uh, question, um, moving forward with um, uh, with a workforce that is evolving and the challenges that we have um, in, in state government and retaining and, and, and attracting a future of our workforce. So I think looking forward towards these through the outsource solutions and truly agile procurement um, is, is a great idea. All right. One thing we do here in Texas, I will say that that we're excited about is we run an innovative procurement lab, and we we have some um, pretty innovative thinkers here in our agency that want to help other state agencies uh, with their procurements to be able to think uh, and be a little bit more flexible about how they're doing things, all within, of course, the the bounds of state law and regulations um, to to deal with the challenges that we have in technology procurement. So, I see that I know that we're we're we've got just about a minute left, I believe, if, if my clock is right. So um, I certainly want to, to thank you all very much. It's been a, a great conversation. I've truly, you've got, you guys have given me a lot to think about um, and I've enjoyed it very much. So thank you all so much for, for your time and your input. And thanks to the audience for joining us as we uh, look forward to 2025 and where we're going with the technology and state government. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. What, what a great panel, uh, Mandy, Steve, Lee, and Bill. Um, excellent, excellent ideas. I, I took a whole bunch of notes here. I was going to try to summarize them a little bit for my comments, but I guess the, the main comment is, you know, a lot of knowledge and, and capability built into this panel that I hope the audience uh, appreciated as much as I did. Great stuff. Thank you so much.
for what you're doing. Um, at this time, we will uh, challenge our perceptions and shift our thinking a little bit. The brain break produced by Genesis will focus on empathy. The bedrock of using technology for inspirational and aspirational purposes. At its conclusion, make sure to jump over to the virtual hallway. After the group chats, there are three breakout sessions to choose from starting at 3 p.m. Eastern. Enjoy, and I hope to see you in the virtual hallway.